again, welcome to our uh, cadre Distinguished Visiting Scholar Series. Um, this series is sponsored by our NIGMS uh, uh, NIH grant, and it consists of a series of lectures throughout the course of the year. Again, this is our first one in 2023. Uh, we have Meg Haney coming in April. Meg is uh, director of the Cannabis Lab at uh, Columbia. And beyond that, we don't have folks scheduled. So we'll encourage those of you in the audience, or if you know people or know of people uh, who would sort of fit the bill as a distinguished scholar, please let us know and we'll consider bringing them on in. It's a very uh, important activity of the cadre and it really enables us to bring in folks who we might not otherwise be able to see face to face. So thank you for coming and uh, we're ready to go today uh, with our speaker. Uh, who is uh, Dr. Matthew Freiberg, an internal medicine physician and cardiovascular epidemiologist. Matt was initially at the University of Pittsburgh. He joined Vanderbilt in 2014 as an associate professor of medicine in the division of cardiology. Uh, he is now professor and founding director of the Vanderbilt Center for Clinical Cardiovascular Outcomes Research and Trials, Evalua Trials Evaluation, a mouthful, which is the reason why they uh, refer to themselves as vCreate. He's also the Dorothy and Lawrence Grossman Chair in Cardiology. Originally from the Pacific Northwest, Dr. Freiberg received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Washington and completed medical school at Oregon Health Sciences University. He completed his postgrad uh, training as a resident of the Chicago hospitals and fellowships at Boston University and the Framingham Heart Study. Dr. Freiberg's research interests include the impact of HIV, inflammation, and altered immunity, and alcohol use on cardiovascular outcomes, topics that are near and dear to our heart at CADRE. He's an expert in the utilization of big data for clinical trial initiatives. He has been a veterans aging cohort investigator for the past dozen years and is presently PI on four NIH-funded VAX ancillary studies, including three R01 grants, a K-12 Scholars Program grant, as well as a recently NIAAA-funded uh, P01. His work includes international initiatives in Uganda and Russia in collaboration with the Boston Urban Arch. I've known and worked some with Matt over the past dozen years, and I will tell you that he is one of the brightest, most generous, and good-natured scientists that you'll come across. Consistent with these, those in the smoking cessation space know Matt as Hillary's husband. And for Hillary, I am sure he is grateful. His talk today is on HIV and cardiovascular disease. Please join me in welcoming one of our field's very best, Matt Freiberg. You guys don't mind if I walk around, kind of like walking, is that all right? Okay, good. Um, and you all can hear me? Yes? No? Good? Perfect. This is the talk. We'll move on. So some of the stuff you already know, humor me for going through it, and I'm going to try to connect the dots to a lot of different fields, and at the end, summarize how all these things fit together, and hopefully I can do that. People are living longer. We know this. People now get non-AIDS diseases, cardiovascular disease, cognitive disorders, liver disease. It's the price of success. We've seen this story already before in the cardiovascular field. People used to die of their heart attacks. They don't die anymore. They just live with their heart failure if we don't get to it soon enough. So we've had some experience in this space. How people get there, though, varies. So HIV to heart attacks or heart failure or stroke or sudden cardiac death, how do we get there while we age? I kind of put things into two buckets. First is biologic. So the virus itself, what it does to your adaptive immune system, those are the T cells that it attacks and also keeps you protected from viruses. Multimorbidity, alcohol, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, renal disease, all of that fits in that space. Antiretroviral therapy. We used to think that it was the therapy among the people with HIV was driving heart disease. The early drugs caused dyslipidemia, caused insulin resistance, driving our events. But we know that's not really true anymore. And it's certainly not relevant with the advent of the medications. Then we get down to things like health disparities, polypharmacy, how people implement clinical guidelines. All of this stuff together gets us to CHD. Now for geeky people like me in the cardiovascular space, this is our picture. Please don't memorize it or try. But what you can see here is that there's a lot of different ways we get down to this space. 
medicines, polypharmacy, prolonged QT, all the comorbidities I mentioned, behaviors, alcohol, smoking, liver disease, poor adherence, affecting things like immune function, microbial translocation, dysbiosis, which we'll talk about later today, what it does to the endothelium, thrombosis, to endpoints. For the purposes today, I just want to look at the blue box and only parts of the blue box. And we're going to spend some time talking about what alcohol does in terms of poor compliance, what it could mean in terms of poor compliance, what it may mean in terms of the adaptive immune system and how it relates to developing heart disease, what it does to the flora in your GI tract, and how that flora in your GI tract and the lack of an adaptive immune system can create a system of disease that links to almost every end organ disease that an HIV infected person may face. We're going to focus on cardiovascular, but I think you'll see it's really everything. Let's see if I can move forward. This was done by Shaw et al. in circulation after we'd had enough studies. And, and what you can see, whether it's cardiovascular events in aggregate, myocardial infarction, stroke, a lot of different hazard ratios, but at the end of the day, it's an increased risk. They quote twofold. I think it's a little less than that, to be honest. But it's still not inconsequential. And so then the question was, well, what, why is this happening? This was the most interesting thing to me. So we published this in 2013. So we took everybody in the, in the VA. VA has the largest number of HIV-infected people in care of any healthcare system in America, in case you were curious. So we took about 50,000 HIV-infected participants, matched them age, race, sex, site. This is the Veterans Aging Cohort Study, Amy Justice PI. We looked at incident events. The VA is a wonderful place to do research. You may not know this, but because there was a paper by Peterson et al. in early 2000s that showed that Medicare beneficiaries had better AMI outcomes than veterans, the secretary of the VA allocated money. They chart reviewed 92,000 AMIs in the VA across every site for a decade to understand why that was. We got the events, which was great for my study, um, and why it happened. But this was the piece. They had an increased risk. But what you saw was the greatest risk was among these people who had a less than 200 CD4 count. That's really interesting for a lot of reasons. Not the least of which, if you have a CD4 count less than 200, your risk of mortality is sixfold higher, which means that you're likely dying before you get your heart attack of interest, of something else. Which means that this risk that we're getting about twofold is actually an underestimation of what's actually happening. So it's considerably higher. Why is that? There's no human model for a loss of an immune system other than HIV, but it presents an interesting human experiment. When you wipe out half of your immune system, what happens to you? Not good things, as you can imagine. And we'll talk a little about why that's important. I just answered that. So this is work, Goran Hansen, probably not a household name. Goran Hansen um, is from Sweden. You may have seen them if you watch the Nobel ceremony. He was the head of the National Academy of Sciences in Sweden. He focused his entire research career on what T cells do and why they matter for heart disease risk. What you find is that without T cells in plaques, you don't get plaques. You often don't get atherosclerosis. They're really essential. But most of that work is all in mice, and mice aren't people. So the question is, how does this work, and why does it matter? T cells secrete interferon gamma, changes your macrophage, creates foam cells, makes plaque, you get plaques, they rupture, you get a heart attack. So what would happen if you didn't have T cells? Well, that's the HIV story, right? I just got done telling you that. So do you not get heart attacks? No, I just told you that the risk is like twofold higher. Doesn't quite make sense. Or maybe it does. So maybe it's the CD4 counts are gone, the virus goes unreplicated, the virus is moving through the system completely uncontrolled, and it's driving an immune response. But how would the virus do that exactly? So it's a complicated question. It's kind of neat when it's complicated. It gives you something to do. So we go on. The first question you ask is, well, is it anywhere else? So if you look at this in stroke, same pattern, same thing. And not just, this is VA data, but it's not just VA data. European data, data from Sub-Saharan Africa, same story. Change the outcome. We'll look at PAD. And these are going in journals like circulation. Exact same story. Look at heart failure, same story. So if you're seeing this across three or four different phenotypes within cardiovascular disease in multiple cohorts in and outside this country, it's not an accident. It's real. So what's happening with that? And further, just one I wanted to make that's really, really interesting. These are people who are developing heart failure before 40. Why does that matter? 
It matters because heart failure is a chronic disease. You get heart failure when you have diabetes forever and hypertension forever. If you're getting it before 40, you don't have things forever. You're not old enough to have it forever. What's their risk? Fourfold increased risk before 40. That's a ridiculous number. I mean, when we talk about things for hazard ratios, like a 20% increased risk, a 30% increased risk, you hear 50 and people almost don't believe it. I'm telling you it's fourfold higher in these people before 40. So that's interesting to me. Why is that? What's happening? And it can't just be hypertension and diabetes. I just told you, it can't. They don't have it. So what is the adaptive immune system doing? They're studying it in all sorts of models. We know that low CD4 counts associated with risk, but we're not sure why. We know that in people with and without HIV and murine models, certain CD4 subsets seem to matter. So we use total CD4 in the clinic. Why? Because it tells us on average, what their immune system is kind of functioning like. It's a poor proxy for maybe how long you've had the disease, but we know that's not really great. And it gives you a sense if the virus is actively replicating, even if you didn't have viral load. If you have a CD4 count of 200, it's highly likely that your virus is uncontrolled. Most studies involving T cell and heart disease, though, are in the plaques. They're mice models. We can't sacrifice people to look at their coronary artery to decide what's happening in their plaques. That doesn't work. And further, we don't really know if what's happening in the plaque is what's happening in your peripheral circulation. So what happens in your peripheral circulation, remember, that's all your organs have a blood supply. I had a vascular surgery fellow tell me why he liked being a vascular surgeon, because he said every organ has a blood supply, so I can operate on almost anything. Um, it's true. So what's in your blood and not in your plaque is likely what's causing the disease. That makes sense? So then we said, OK, why don't we take a look at this? So we got a grant to do it. So the VAX is a veteran JG cohort study as a observational prospective longitudinal study of veterans with HIV and without HIV in care at nine sites. And they come in and they answer surveys and a group of them provided blood specimens and we did flow cytometry on all these T cell subsets. We're looking at the traditional cardiovascular events and since the association was the same across all these outcomes, we felt comfortable linking them. It was the same thing. The standard list of demographics and Cox proportional hazards model, but you could use whatever you want. Don't let this cause you have a seizure. All I want you to know is that these people are about 50 years of age. They're mostly non-white. They have a lot of burden of comorbid disease. So you know who you're dealing with when you study them. That's what I want you to get from this slide. This slide, however, is a lot on there. But I want you to know something that we did not expect that's critically important. And I'm going to actually just put my little thing here. So when you lose your CD4 counts, what happens to you exactly? Do you lose these cells? equally, like the same proportion, like there's 50 different types of T cells you have in your body, and I've only listed ones that made sense from science. Th1 or interferon gamma cells, which are linked to atherosclerosis, Goran Hansen's work. Th2 are thought to be protective. Th17 can do both. Temera and senescent cells are what happen when your immune system's getting burned through, and they're what's left. These are particularly nasty cells. They don't like to die. They're highly pro-inflammatory. They're not what you want in your circulation in large numbers. But we all have some, because we all age. You can't stop that. But what I want you to see in this line, here's an HIV negative person, about 6% of all the cells when we did flow cytometry. When your CD4 counts less than 200, it's, it's one in four of what you have in your circulation. And it goes up as you burn through your immune system. We weren't expecting that, actually. Why is that? I'm still not sure. But it's critically important. Why? Because I want to see on the next slide, when you go up, these are the Th1 cells that Goran Hansen talks about that sit in the plaque and cause disease. Almost 45% of your circulating T cells when you're here are things that are bad for you. Interferon gamma producing are highly pro-inflammatory. The last thing you would want is what you've got left. So it starts to explain why these people less than 200 are having heart attacks. Well, if all you've got left is this, that's not good for you. And it tracks with these things, IL-6, headwaters for inflammation, D-dimer, altered coagulation, soluble CD14, really monocyte activation. All of these are substantially higher in these people when you've burned through their system. So these people have a problem. Antiretroviral therapy isn't just for getting you to a place where you can have immunocompetency. You want normal distributions of things. So that started to make some sense to us. 
like, okay, now I think I can explain it. And I'll tell you further, I'm not showing it, but most people are HIV infected or CMV positive. If you go back and look at the literature 30 years ago, CMV antibodies were linked to cardiovascular disease, New England Journal. And the uninfected in our population, it's about 70% uninfected have CMV, almost 100 in the HIV. If you look at the uninfected HIV infected people, they have even half of these numbers. They're even lower on the senescent cells. They're even lower on stuff, which is why there's some investigators who think maybe we should have CMV vaccines because everybody eventually gets it. And it seems to be linking in HIV as the model to accelerating some of this adaptive immune system that's contributing to aging. It's interesting stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, so you're getting a sense of what's happening there. When we link it to events, this is out of Jack. We just published this. One of uh, my mentees, uh, Shuman Kundu, just published this. What you see in the HIV negative people, we didn't see much of an association, though. Now, granted, it was a much smaller sample size than the positives. In the positives, we see some of the significant associations for these cells. I will tell you, we replicated this in CHS and MESA in uninfected people with much larger numbers and didn't see the adaptive immune system doing this with regards to risk. It was only in the positive people. Well, that's interesting. Why might that be? Exactly. And we went through and looked at different outcomes. Heart failure shows this, and atherosclerotic disease shows this. And there's slight differences, and I don't want you to get lost in that. The point of these slides was we saw what we expected to see in the positives. We didn't see in the negatives. Why might that be? This is why it might be. Totally fascinating basic science. This is um, Klaus Leilab out at La Jolla Institute. So his science in his basic science lab gets down to what is the antigen that stimulates the individual T cell? Crazy. If you look at his data, and this is out of nature, you can see that some of these cells, depending on what they're in, can either be plaque stabilization or they can become pro-atherosclerotic. Same thing for Th17, all of these cells. So is it that it's not even the type of T cell you have, it's the antigen that's binding to the receptor on the individual T cell that biases it to do what it's going to do. CMV is one of those antigens, people think. HIV appears to be another. So in addition to burning through the immune system, what immune system you have left, if you've got overwhelming num numbers of virus, those naive T cells are locking onto that and they're clonically upgrading. Are there other antigens that can do this? This is how this talk starts to fit together. We're gonna jump ahead a little bit and then get there. Imagine you screw up your GI tract. You change the bacteria in it, and then you create a leaking syndrome where those bacteria move out of the gut, they go into your portal circulation, and they start your immune cascade. We all have a little bit of that. You shouldn't have a lot of that. Liver disease people, end-stage liver disease, get. SBP, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Why? Because they're leaking all over the place. It's a model that we've seen before. We know the story. Except that HIV and alcohol do this, jumping ahead. But the point I'm trying to get at is, is it possible that antigen specificity for the given T cell, in addition to wiping out your adaptive immune system, is really the driver that drives this risk? And if it's pro-inflammatory, it doesn't shock you, right, that people get neurocognitive problems, and this group has seen that. When they do the fMRI of the brain, you see neuroinflammation. Where do you think that came from? When you see kidney failure, when you see problems with the lung, when you see heart failure, it starts to make some biologic sense. So a summary from this little bit is just simply T cell subsets seem to matter. They're linked with events. We didn't see them in the uninfected people. They persisted despite adjusting for a myriad things. And it's not clear whether it's the antigen biasing the T cell driving the response that's giving you the disease. So I want you to hold those thoughts. We'll come back to it. Don't forget it. I'll help remind you. We're going to go to here now. So this is something this group knows well, right? Alcohol's bad for you, and it's common, and it's present in a lot of people. It's linked to a lot of adverse health outcomes. You need less of it to get the same amount of damage. It's linked to all these bad things, which I've already mentioned. And it even travels with things together. You know, smoking, alcohol, depression, syndemic stuff. Natalie Cicchetto, who's at Florida now, is very interested in that. We know these things. This model is something we started thinking about in 2010, but I really wasn't smart enough to think about the dysbiosis. In fact, it really hadn't even crossed my mind but it's the same concept. So if you're an HIV-infected person and you drink alcohol, I know it raises your blood pressure and screws up your lipids, it makes your insulin resistance works, and it travels with smoking, and this whole pathway can give you a heart attack. 
and it doesn't need any help. But unfortunately, that's not all that alcohol does to you. And if you're HIV infected, it's definitely not all that it does to you. You've got this whole other special pathway. So the first thing it does, as we know, is it may create noncompliance. So I just spent the last 10 minutes or so saying if you're noncompliant and the HIV virus goes uncontrolled and your adaptive immune system gets whacked, I'm leaving you with a very unhealthy adaptive immune system. And that's just if you're noncompliant. But we know that's not all that it does. So when alcohol gets into your gut, it does a number of different things. It changes the microbial flora in your gut. Why does that matter? It matters because some of those bacteria that you have in your gut make butyrate. Why do we care about butyrate? We care about butyrate because butyrate is the energy source for all those cells that line the inside of your GI tract. And when those cells can't get energy, they get compromised. They die. They leak. They create gaps. So when you drink alcohol, you start messing up with the dysbiosis. You also potentially alter the structural integrity of the gut, which it causes the leak. And further, so when you leak all this stuff into your GI tract, and everyone does on modern amounts, why don't you die of sepsis? Because you have a liver. These cup for cells in the liver's whole job, it leaks right into the portal circulation, and the first organ those things see is the liver. And it's supposed to act like a vacuum cleaner under normal circumstances. But overwhelming volumes of bacteria, your liver wasn't built for that. And it certainly wasn't built that if alcohol's damaging your liver, hepatitis C is damaging your liver, the ART is damaging your liver, and the HIV uncontrolled is damaging your liver. The liver's like, what the hell? I can't do this for you. So what happens? It passes through. So what do naive T cells do? They've spent their whole life wondering, where is my perfect antigen? Right? They come out of the thymus, they float around, they've got a receptor. They spend their whole life figuring out, what am I supposed to match to? Well, now they're getting a truckload of stuff to match to. Why? Because you can't vacuum it up. So your entire immune system becomes activated, chronically. Not just from the HIV virus now. Right? It's done its job. It's wiping out your adaptive immune system. And the first place it does it actually is in the gut. You know that the CD4 counts get wiped out in the gut first, and then it works its way through. But even if you get rid of the HIV virus, if you've damaged this gut and can't heal it, then you've got this perpetual immune response. This goes to heart disease. So great. Now the HIV-infected alcohol person has two pathways, like they need more. And oh, by the way, HIV all by itself causes dysbiosis and gut leak even without alcohol. So now you imagine you're an HIV-infected person who's got alcohol and hep C. You think of them, from a cardiovascular perspective, I think of them totally differently now. It's not just about giving them a statin and making their LDL cholesterol go down. It's more complicated than that. So remember I told you I had to hold that thought? So, so this piece, alcohol abuse, it seems to affect our adaptive immune system beyond just making you not compliant with your medications. In fact, it seems to decrease your T cell numbers. It causes certain increased T cells, most of them CD8. CD4, which we've been talking about, the helper cells, it's still out. But CD8 definitely increases your memory cells and may alter your thymus development. So great. So in addition to all the stuff I just told you about microbial translocation, alcohol screwing with your adaptive immune system as if it needs any more things to screw with it if you've already got HIV that's uncontrolled. This is from um, Patricia Molina's group out at um, and, and LSU, and what I want you to notice a couple of things, oop, it cuts at the top, but they had audit data, timeline follow back data, PEF data. PEF data is this alcohol biomarker, last two weeks tells you what you've been drinking or if you have been drinking anyway. I don't need to tell the rest of the group what these things are, but what I want you to see is the exhausted activated cells, like Temra, which I showed you before, linked to alcohol, linked to alcohol. These are CD8, not CD4, but my point is, alcohol is messing with your adaptive immune system, above and beyond what HIV is doing. So alcohol is hitting you two places when you drink. It's hitting on your immune system and it's hitting your gut and then making your immune system work even harder than it wants to given all the stress it's under. Now when we looked at PEF and CD4, all I want you to take away from the slide, please don't look at it more, you'll seize or something, is, is that we didn't see a, a direct correlation. So it's not clear to me that alcohol is directly modifying CD4 cell count numbers or proportions and that it may be on the CD4 side, it's really, really through not, drink, or not taking your meds, letting the virus go uncontrolled, and going this pathway. We're not seeing the same thing as Patricia saw in CD8. By the way, I didn't have her this talk, but I had someone run it for me at my thing this morning, got a text. We got the same thing Patricia did on the CD8 side, but not the CD4 side, just so you know. Sorry I didn't have it in a slide. 
So I talked a little about this, but alcohol. Chronic alcohol leads to intestinal permeability and microbial translocation. Animal models lowers this butric acid. Remember what I said? That's the part, that's the energy source that the cells need in order to stay healthy, in order to keep the gut intact. And we know that alcohol damages enterocytes. It causes reactive oxygen species, which is never a good thing, causes cells to die a little bit early, and affects tight gap junctions. Those are things that keep your gut intact. When they split, things leak across. Now, I mentioned this, but I'm going to go. So HIV, gosh, it's almost the same damn thing. So it's a two-hit kind of problem, right? HIV does targets the mucosal epithelium. It disrupts the gut junctions, causes early cell death, increased permeability, causes systemic inflammation, the dysbiosis. So what's that word? I've used it a couple of times. Let's just define it. Dysbiosis just means that whatever your normal gut flora should look like in a person, it's altered in some way. Bacteria are overgrowth, so stuff that should be as small amounts as in large amounts, or stuff that should be there becomes absent. That's all that it is. And there's a myriad of different ways to describe it, because you have like 2,000 different kinds of species of bacteria in your gut. So any kind of alteration is a dysbiosis. But we're more interested in the butyrate hypothesis for this, because of how that small chain fatty acid, short chain fatty acid works. So decreases richness. Think of it like this. It's like ecology. When we were talking yesterday, ecology. So the more diverse your environment, the better off you are, right? It's the same with your gut. When you aren't diverse, it's bad for you. HIV, alcohol, even antibiotics, they change the diversity in your gut. And that's why, total side note, not an expert in it, but relevant, that's why people are getting so worried about people taking antibiotics all the time. It's not just resistance for like strep and other things. It's like, they're not specific to just your mouth. It's doing this, that antibiotic is doing what HIV and alcohol do to your gut. They're wiping out flora. It expects to come back. And it's a temporary exposure, not a chronic one. But that's why people are worried about it. It messes with everything everywhere. And then it alters metabolic pathways, which we're going to talk about. Tryptophan pathway, TMAO pathway butyrate. TMAO, Stan Hazen's group, Cleveland Clinic, New England Journal, found that TMAO was this process, or this metabolite that's linked to cardiovascular disease. It's produced by bacteria that's in your gut. So when you start messing around with a certain bacteria, if you upgrade those that make TMAO, going through the whole pathway, you're causing cardiovascular risk, independent of everything else that I've told you. This is just what it looks like, alcoholic liver disease, phylum class, order, family, genus. Thank God, I don't, Sharish Barve is a multiple PI with me, he's the basic scientist who's in this. I can never keep these things straight. Thank God there are textbooks, but these group, right here, these major ones go down in alcohol and gut dysbiosis and liver disease. They are the bacteria that are primarily responsible for butyrate. So it's not just an HIV model, it's an alcohol model. Liver disease does the same thing. And when you look, again, this is another paper from um, Patricia's group. If you take the alcohol audit, timeline followback, and PETH, if you're looking, her alpha-1 antitrypsin is her model for leak, and IFBB, intestinal fatty acid binding protein, for, for injury, you can see that some of these are linked to damage with alcohol in her group. And the same thing here with regards to dysbiosis, we're seeing the same thing for alpha and beta diversity. And that's within sample and between samples. We won't spend a lot of time there. But simple to say that in HIV, when you drink alcohol, it's creating a dysbiotic picture and it's promoting leak in humans, not primates, not mice, in humans. So, that's really important. We're seeing similar stuff. So just like I told you that some T cells, you know, it's not enough to know CD4 cell, that underneath CD4 we've got Th1, Th2, Th17. And these things have different roles. Dysbiosis, I told you, was could be any alteration in the 2,000 bacteria that live in your gut at any given time. So what would happen if it's not just dysbiosis, but it's, we'll call it an enterotype that there's a specific kind of dysbiosis that may be contributing to more harm than good. And if you knew that, why does that matter? It matters because the gut, I'm gonna argue, and intestinal permeability are targets in alcohol research for improving health outcomes while you're getting people to quit alcohol because that's hard. If you can't stop the exposure, mitigate the pathway that it causes damage, this gut process is a mitigation pathway and there's multiple places to intervene. This was out of nature in 2011. It's just simply a technique that allows you to take bacteria. And, and for the record, you know, we still don't really understand what we're doing in the gut with all these bacteria. I know people get up there and they talk about it, but we don't. 
It's really complicated. The math's ridiculous. And why? Imagine if you're trying to juggle 2,000 different types of bacteria simultaneously in a model to know whether something's causing harm or being beneficial. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Um, it's okay, we'll catch up, we'll get smarter. But for this point, they're trying to break these bacteria down into groups that make it more manageable for us to understand, categorize, and analyze. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. So we took a study in Russia. So we had the St. Peter study. The St. Peter study was looking at trying to ask if partial agonist, I'm gonna make sure I stay on time, yeah. Partial agonist therapy um, versus nicotine replacement would reduce alcohol and smoking. These drugs were approved for smoking, but there's NIAAA data so that it might work for alcohol too. Whether it's working centrally in the brain or working to get them to quit smoking, that's easier to quit your second habit kind of thing. So these are HIV infected heavy drinking, Russian heavy drinking, by the way, which was a whole new thing after I started working there. It's very different than US heavy drinking. We're not in, we, they would be Olympians and we would not. Let's just put it that way. And they're smoking a pack a day. These people all had hep C, 30% were active opioid users and 40% were depressed by CESD. These are not lightweight people. These are people who have real issues. Um, and just to dispel the myth, which was the most important thing we published in this paper, these people, these people, we had 80% follow-up at a year, okay? And oh, by the way, so you don't stick your foot in your mouth, which I've done more than once, but this was a classic. When we were translating our English to Russian so that we could administer it, I was listening to it and I said, well, are we sure that they're gonna understand what's going on? And the nurse, everybody there's like pentalingual or whatever, because they all speak so many languages. She turns to me and says, oh, Dr. Freiberg, um, they'll be able to understand. They've all read Tolstoy. I'll sit down now and be quiet. You know, understand where you are, cultural competency, in, you know, their educational structure. So they may have some issues. I wasn't sure, but if you can read Tolstoy, you can read my survey. Just a lesson I learned from myself, but um, lovely people. And again, 80% follow-up with all of this at 12 months. Further, we were told you shouldn't give varenicline to people with alcohol disorders. It was an FDA black box warning, which obviously doesn't apply in Russia, and there was some concern about it. We had zero complications for an entire year with that drug with all these people, not one. So no doctor should ever, 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 ever say that you can't give varenicline if you want to for smokers when they have heroin, alcohol, hep C, depression, smoking, whatever, they did just fine, thank you. So that was probably the most important thing that came out of the study. But in addition to that, we built a microbiome study within this on a separate grant to look at their GI tract as they're going through their clinical trial to understand what would happen if they changed alcohol, changed smoking, et cetera. And we did metagenomics and metabolomics, and I won't go into details with that. When we did this dimensionality reduction algorithms, I swear I should be a computer scientist, but this is the, their speak. But it's basically an AI way for us to break apart these groups so that we can analyze them differently. So we ended up with three groups out of all the people that we had to categorize their microbiome. And we call them enotype one, two, and three. And what you see is they look different. Back, you know, the percent of colonies look different across these three. You'd say, well, what difference does that make? Why might the different bacteria, they, you know, butrate versus non-butrate? First thing we find is that with regard to diversity, group three has far more diversity than the other two. What did I tell you before? Diversity is good for you. You want to be diverse. So we already have a sense that if you're not as diverse as your neighbor, something may not work for you. This is just a different measure to look at diversity. You can see there's some overlap, but they're kind of separate, showing that the groupings work. And as I said before, there's, oh my God, 3.8 times 10 to 13th, I don't know what number that is, bacterial cells in 2,000 species like we mentioned. These are the kind that are there. FB ratio is a very crude measure to tell us how your, your dysbiosis is working. The closer to one you are, the better off you are. If you're too high from one or too low from one, it's a cheap, easy way to tell us you've got some kind of dysbiosis. But as I said before, it's a big term and you can be any kind of dysbiosis. But we're looking at three groups right now. Butyrate producers are often in the firmicute, so we care about them because, as I said before, butyrate we're interested in. It's our hypothesis. It's the short-chain fatty acid that keeps the cells healthy that would prevent the leak if you had enough. And we look at FB ratio. Guess what? These people are pretty close to one and three, but these people are pretty far from one, and these people are in the middle. And firmicutes, as I said before, are the people that make the, be the, that make the butyrate. So you might suspect that the people who are going to be closest to one are going to be the healthiest people and, and may or may not. When we use a heat map to look at butyrate-producing genotypes or enterotypes, you can see across here without being 
an expert in this, they don't look the same, do they? Nope, they're not. And we further, when we look at the genes that are doing this, it's very, very different. It's almost absent here. What we're linking up now is we're looking at all their blood biomarkers to these enterotypes now. Our hypothesis is these people are the ones who are gonna be the most inflamed. We're gonna look at their adaptive immune system. And ideally, if you could get Lay's lab in, in La Jolla, we expect that it may be their T cell receptors and the antigen that I'm talking about. These are the ones who are leaking the most, driving the immune system and may have the worst outcomes. We aren't powered for that, but that's where we're going. So this is a nice little schematic of what I've been trying to talk about. This is your healthy gut. As I said before, alcohol, gut damage, dysbiosis, diversity goes down. This one goes up, but that's actually misleading. Translocation goes up, systemic inflammation, the same process over here. It's a two-hit hypothesis which gets you to this damaged gut and moving forward. That's why these people have such issues and why I think they're having all these non-AIDS issues across all the organ systems because this connects to everything. And this I just tossed in there just saying, when we think about it for CVD, which I'm most interested in, you can tell that LPS, gut dysbiosis, and permeability are all linked to various cardiovascular outcomes in the general population, and we see the same thing in HIV. So this fits intrinsically. It's not contradicting something that's been published before us. This is the model. You drink alcohol, it goes into your gut, it generates dysbiosis, it causes leak. LPS polysaccharides and these peptidyl glycans drive this drive these things like vascular inflammation. Your adaptive immune system is less, is already pro-inflammatory. The metabolites are all altered. Butyrate goes down, we talked about that. Bile acids that are responsible for decreased inflammation get distorted. TMA gets overproduced, goes to the liver, makes TMAO and starts here. And this is all plaque badness. That's what we think is happening. So if you can fix this, fix this, block this, block that, that may help people who have HIV and alcohol get through while you're getting the virus under control and you're getting them off the substance. That's our hypothesis. That's what we're working with. And so this is simply to say these are targets. If you can fix the barrier, if you can fix the butrate, if you can restore proper, I, won't, I don't go into the peptide hormones, but this is what people think can help people be better. So our approach to intervention. This was a grant that we did for zinc Zinc is actually one of those things that protects your gap junction, decreases when you're a heavy drinker, can decrease when you have HIV. And the nice thing is it's cheap, it's available, it doesn't interact with most things. Um, so we asked the question, if you gave heavy drinking people with HIV in Russia is where we conducted this, and you gave them zinc, yes, no, um, for a total of 18 months, and we did 18 months because of um, a study that had been published showing it slowed um, immunodeficiency I'm blanking on her name in Florida, it'll come back to me. But um, we, we modeled it after that. And I already told you what these people are like, so we don't need to spend much time there. Um, when you look at the outcomes, so our primary outcome was the VAX index, which is a measure of mortality, 0.06, awful number. But um, what you can see is that the adjusted mean difference, their VAX points were 4.6 lower, which is like basically 12.12%, 12 12%, I think, on absolute risk with regards to mortality. We saw their CD4 counts were typically higher, Reynolds' risk score didn't change very much, and that's okay. And that may be not a bad thing, but CRP is made in the liver. CRP is a great model if you don't have liver disease. If you have liver disease, you don't make as much CRP. It's hard to measure that. So that probably wasn't our best choice, but I wanted to see it anyway. IL-6 was lower. D-dimer was lower. LPS was lower. This is the table I want to show you because this is what the editor wouldn't let me publish. So... We published a negative study um, because it was shown not to be there. This was our secondary analysis, which said we chose 18 months as our primary analysis because other studies had done it, but we collected data at 6, 12, and 18 months. And we analyzed it separately at 6, 12, and 18 months and saw the same thing. So we pooled the data, just tripled the power. And guess what? Now it's the same change except we're at 0.02 CD4 count up but not significant, but now we've lowered inflammation statistically, and lowered LBP, lipopolysaccharide binding protein, marker of amino, marker of translocation, and, and the process I've talked about. Zinc did all of this. Really disturbed that I couldn't publish that. Um, but 
nevertheless, ACTG came out with a pilot study that showed the same thing, and now ACTG is doing a definitive study, more powerful than this, which is great. And hopefully, this will be usable for people. And as it turns out, when I was at Croy, there was an investigator who told me that they'd actually put zinc in ART like 20 years ago, because they thought it had antiviral properties. So I can't claim to be clever enough to have thought of that, but we tried it anyway. Um, this was the varenicline study that I mentioned before, where we're comparing varenicline and cytosine. Cytosine is the naturally occurring drug that varenicline is built on. It's only available in Europe and other countries. It's not FDA approved here yet, but the first study, I believe, is going to be coming out in a major journal shortly, um, and I suspect it will be approved here. Why is it important? It's dirt cheap, and you take it in 30 days. Varenicline's $1,200. This was $25. So I think that you're going to see this. And we thought that these two drugs, the partial agonist, would do better than the full agonist for alcohol. Um, we didn't see it. Now, this was a null study in the sense that there was no difference between the groups. So one of the Lancet journals I was really disappointed in said, well, you know, it's a negative study because there's no difference between the groups. I said, OK, well, these are pack-a-day smokers, and they have mean heavy drinking days of nine or seven. And by three months, their median heavy drinking days was zero, and their cigarettes are five across all arms. Uh, OK, it's no different between the groups because everyone's doing better. That's kind of nice. Um, and it showed we follow them at 6 and at 12 months and got the same data. So why might that be? You know, it's complicated. I wasn't expecting it to do better. I don't know. And by the way, when we looked at abstinence, abstinence was self-report, no alcohol, and a PEF less than 8. So. They were abstinent. Now, this is the part that we were able to publish with this was an at post hoc table. These are the people who are who quit smoking and the people who didn't. And if you look at all alcohol abstinence, the people who quit it was 35% versus 17%. And again, self-report plus PEF. There's a big difference there. And you see those similar differences in abstinence later on down the line. So is it that you quit smoking in these people and then it's easier to quit drinking, or is it something centrally in your brain? And my wife is the lead author and wrote the paper on this and is smarter than I am, and she would say that it's still possibly for both, but it needs to be explored. But given that varenicline is generic and cytosine is cheap, at the bare minimum, if you have someone who smokes and drinks, give them this, because you may get a benefit for alcohol, and it is already FD approved for smoking. You're not doing any mismanagement. You just make it a second bang for your buck. And like I said before, what's important, these were HIV infected, heavy drinking, smoking, hep C, heroin using, 30% and 40% depressed, and all of them tolerated varenicline. Show me someone sicker. Show me someone more high risk. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And we reported all that. We gave that to the journal just for other people to know. Like, we did not have an issue at all. So to me, that was the most important thing, was that you know we can't say to use it for alcohol. That's not what our data says, and that would be not true. But if they smoke and they happen to drink heavily, please do. Get rid of their smoking, and maybe you'll help with their alcohol too. And I hope people pursue this. I mean, we had a relatively small study. I think there's stuff in there. I think there's still stuff to sort out. Um, but that's the scoop with that. Which leads us to our last thing. I got 10 minutes. I'm going to do it. 10 minutes, PO1. Um, so. We've tried to intervene um, with the zinc, with the barrier. We tried to intervene by um, giving them drugs that will stop them with their behavior. So the last part for us was, could we manipulate your gut bacteria for you? That was the question we're trying to ask. So when we look at this, it's gut, you know, could the gut dysbiosis be a true therapeutic target? So we know heavy drinking and dysbiosis are common. I just told you that increases the risk of CVD. We think so. Loss of butyrate's bad for you, told you that. Leaky gut inflammation are harmful, yes. So the question is, if I intentionally manipulated the bacteria in your gut, could I change this whole process? So it's interesting in animal models, at the lab that the Dr. McLean and Sharisha's alcohol center in Louisville, in rats, if they manipulate the microbiome, the gut doesn't leak there, and the liver doesn't take nearly as much of a hit. Which incidentally begs the question, is cirrhosis really due to that simple alcohol molecule? Is cirrhosis really due to the overwhelming bacterial overload and inflammation and it kind of auto-eats itself? That is a fascinating question. Because if that were true, then cirrhosis leading to transplant, this would be a mechanism by which to slow that process for people. 
if that were true. So we're asking the question if we can do it for you and manipulate it. So we had an RCT, a cohort study, and our, lab, our course. Picture you've seen before. Our hypothesis is that if we give you this bacteria, even when you drink, and we've shown in animal models that that's OK, and you can get the bacteria and change it, if we change your flora and increase all those butyrate producers that we think disappear or are outcompeted by alcohol, we will shut this process down while you're trying to quit. And importantly, I'm only giving back what you already had. So I'm not introducing something foreign to you. I'm simply helping you with what you've lost through whatever mechanism. So we're building these capsules that they have that are putting butyrate back into your body with two capsules a day. And the idea is that I will fix the gut dysbiosis, or we, it's not an I, there's never an I, we, and change the downstream metabolites as well. And potentially, based on work from this center and people in Florida, if the hypothesis is right that the neuroinflammation is really a function of the systemic inflammation, which is really a function of you leaking your gut, then theoretically, some of that neuroinflammation that affects your craving and how you drink, that you should consume less, in theory. So we put an exploratory name just for fun. Do they drink less doing this? We've done nothing to, we've done nothing to change their drinking patterns. There's no pharmacology, there's nothing. We want to see if it does this. If that were true, then targets in the brain, the neuroinflammation that people have been working on in this group and others, it's a wonderful target using this to change what's happening in your brain. This is what the trial looks like. It's 125 in each arm. People get the probiotic versus not. We follow them six. We're not having 18 more months. Why? Because Vladimir Putin screwed up my life. <laughs> Vladimir Putin screwed up my life, which I never thought would happen, but he did because my study was supposed to run in Russia. These people had just done five years giving me all these stool samples to characterize their entire microbiome. I had literally had everybody already enrolled to do the trial. They all wanted to do it. It makes sense, right? Until Vladimir Putin decided to, in, inside to invade Ukraine. And then I got a nasty grant from the White House and the State Department saying that I was sending federal dollars to the Russian Federation, which is in violation of new US law. To which the Vanderbilt attorneys flipped out, understandably. So we had to stop sending money to Russia, which I couldn't compete with. So I had to move this entire trial back to the United States, which really sucks because I lost all that five-year data before. I can't replicate that. It's gone. I can do the trial, but to know what happened to these people the five years leading up and then do the trial in them, you could really tell them, this is what happened to you. And that's gone, courtesy of that man. So I'll say I'm probably being recorded and hopefully I don't come after me. But anyway, that's what he, that's what he, that's what he did to me. So, so we're doing it. It's just we wish we had, we wish we had done that. Um, the second part is this. We're looking at each three of these chains and asking ourselves if these metabolites that are made by the bacteria that come through, we're looking at them in the vax and linking them to cardiovascular events 10 years later. So we'll do the whole pipeline from in to the gut to in your blood to having a heart attack 10 years later. And we'll prove that it works. So if we can change the dysbiosis, alters these metabolites, they're linked to a future event, then we can do the real trial that makes it real therapy. It's the step that's the, the last step. So putting it all together, um, got five minutes. Okay, people are living longer. We know this. Non-AIDS disease risk is driven, I think, largely due to lack of adaptive immunity and importantly due to alcohol. I think alcohol and HIV are a two-hit hypothesis that's causing the same thing twice over. I think that it's causing all this in here that I've already talked about, and I feel that if that's true, then the targets I've just mentioned are viable for anybody and NIAAA to go after, and not just for heart disease because every organ has a blood supply. So whether it's dementia, it's lung disease, kidney disease, I don't care. I think it's all the same. That's my two cents. OK, last thing, acknowledgments, NIAAA. Kendall Bryant. Kendall Bryant helped get me my K award. Oh my god, he's been doing this a long time. Um, unbelievably fabulous. Vax participants and Pavlov State Medical University uh, participants, people who made the trials happen, my teams. I want to do this for the trainees in the room. I'm a full professor, tenured, endowed chair, run a center, top of the food chain. These people made me possible. Never forget where you came from. Important to maintain the relationships. This isn't a one-off. You finish your training, you leave. Amy Justice helped me write my very first grant um, for almost $7 million. No way I would have got that as a third year in a K without Amy anchoring me. Help me, because I wanted to do cardiovascular. She didn't, but she knew, she knew HIV. I was so nervous when I got there. I said, University of Yale. Holy shit, can you believe that? Who says that? You know, I was so nervous. Um, she made that possible. Vossen, 
He goes by Voss, even though that's his last name. It's a long story, we don't have time. But Vossen is like one of my best friends. We talk every day, we text every day. I know when he's, sl we'll talk like at a midnight, because I know he's up, he tells you a little about myself. But, but Vossen was the one, I had almost written and finished a K award at the Framingham Heart Study, and when I told him about this HIV CBD hypothesis, he said, scrap the whole K, start a new one. Do you know how much work I put into that? He said, this K will get you funded, this K is a career. Stop what you're doing, we'll find the experts in HIV, scrap the whole Framingham grant. That's months of work. We met every Thursday for three hours going over this stuff, and then he told me to scrap it. He was right, 100% right. Jeff Samet was the one who helped me get my K award, and then I left Boston to go to Pittsburgh with my K award. He didn't get upset, he just continued to work with me. It's the reason I work in Russia, I have grants with him. Lou Culler recently passed away. When I was a trainee, he had crossed the thousandth publication marker. I just do the math, that's, that's nuts. Lou Culler, and this is important, Peter, so just humor me, I know you gotta go, but um, when I met him, he looked at my grant with Amy and said, oh, I know what you need to do. You need to do like CTs and, and this and this and this to get the whole elephant to understand it. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm a third year of a K. Like, how's that gonna happen? So he yells, it's like a sitcom, like out of Seinfeld. Monica! It, it, he has his assistant for like 40 years. Monica comes out, get Matt Budoff on the phone. Now, call Matt Budoff in LA. Matt comes on the speakerphone. Hey, Lou, what's up? I have a person writing a grant. He needs you to do all the CT work, give him all the protocols, set it up at the VA, make it happen. Can you do that? Sure, Lou, no problem. All right, he'll be in contact in a week. Thanks so much. Click. Monica, get John Gardino on the phone, Maryland. We're eating lunch. We're having, we're having corned beef on rye with celery soda. To this day, I hate celery soda, but I'll eat it. I'll drink it with Lou. I don't know why he likes it, but he does. We're sitting there. John gets on the phone. He does all the ECHO protocols for the American Heart Association. Is the person who reviews the ECHO at the Framingham Heart Study. John, I need you to do all the ECHO protocols for Matt at all his sites at the VA. Give him the protocols. Read all the ECHOs so that he can get this grant. Sure, Lou, no problem. Great, thanks so much. Click. Third. Russ Tracy has the biomarker. His, his biorepository is bigger than the NHLBI's. Core lab for, NA, for CHS, MESA. Russ, I need you to do all the tubes, all the labs, all the protocols for all the blood he's gonna collect, PBMC, serum plasma, blah, 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 blah. You need to do it for him. It's a really important study. Make it all happen, and he'll call you in a week. Sure, Lou, fine. We got $8 million. Why? Not because of me. That was not because of me. Lou did that. And then Russ Tracy, I just mentioned, you know, he's been wonderful in doing all this stuff. So I say all this, that I still work, well, I can't with Lou anymore, but I work with everybody on this list. And I've been working with them for almost a decade and a half. And I wouldn't be standing here without them. And then lastly to Peter. So Peter didn't train me. I didn't come to Brown, though I could have, and it would have been great. Um, but Peter always, if I had questions, he answered them, invited me to places like this, and then he would come to talks when I would give them. The first one, if you may remember, was in Paris. Scared to death, we got something with Isbra to talk about HIV and heart disease, and Jeffrey and I were doing that. I'm in Paris, I haven't done a thing like this, I don't know who's gonna show up, I'm a really newer investigator. And you know, Peter came and gave support, and that's important too. You know, mentorship isn't just the day in and day out thing, it's what you do for people in your circle, inviting you to things, looking out for you, being available, all that stuff matters. So everything I've said today on the science thing is important, but I'll argue, I'm sorry, it's one after. This is probably as important as everything I've just told you for the last 50 minutes. Medicine and research is about science and relationship, period, full stop. You will not do this on your own and you will not succeed without help and it won't be as fun if you're not working with people you like. So I encourage you as you go through this process and you meet people, you know, if you like them, continue to work with them. Develop that relationship. You know, don't just when you leave, it ends kind of thing. None of these people are in my institution now. Yale, down in Texas, Boston, Pittsburgh, Vermont. So that's it. Sorry I ran a little over. That's all I have to say. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks for your attention, and thanks for letting me be here for two days. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, I'm wondering if you had enough people in the Varenicline study uh, who did not uh, quit smoking and whether or not you've looked at their alcohol data. 
Um, I haven't specific, the, the, the pairwise comparison you saw, we haven't gone into the four wide, but we could, but we didn't yet. But we could see what happened with them, yes, for sure. And I, it's, it's an even distribution, so it's 100, 100, 100. So it would be 100 people on varenicline that got a placebo NRT that would be in that group. And we said that um, at three months abstention was 20%, 22. Um, so you'd have 80% who didn't fully quit. Um, heavy drinking days definitely went down. Um, and I haven't looked at the timeline follow back to know exactly how many drinks that is. Um, but there should be enough theoretically to do that. Yes, I would think you could. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. I was, I was wondering about the HIV um, gut axis. Yeah. And did you notice anything in that uh, pathway based on how uh, the gut looked depending on levels of adherence to ART? So, there's, so the reason the gut is so irritating is that so many things actually influence it. So the hardest one is actually diet. You try to capture what people, so for instance, if you eat a ton of fish, and it turns out people in St. Petersburg do, fish massively alters TMAO production line, unbelievably so. So not only ART, which we can look at, but the diet, whether you're compliant, all that stuff, yes, it influences the, duck, the gut. And, and this is why I say we don't really know very much. If you look at the science and nature papers, you know what they do? Diabetes, no diabetes, Here's what their gut looks like. Look at these differences. This is important. That's unadjusted epi as far as I'm concerned. A million things could be going on besides diabetes, yes, no. But that's because we just don't know enough yet, and it's hard to categorize it. What we think is that the gut does matter, and there's enough evidence, I think, to support that hypothesis. Now, the question getting down to brass tacks is exactly how to manipulate it, what's happening when you take into account all the things that can go into the gut. That we haven't been smart enough to do, in my opinion. We're building some models that honestly, one of the problems is that you want to adjust for everything, but the model becomes overfit. And the reason it becomes overfit is to do microbiome work is unbelievably expensive. So unlike Framingham, where you have 5,000 people and you get a biomarker for 25 bucks, that's not what happens when you do this. So the cost limits associated with grants limit your sample size as best you can, which means that you take more basic analyses to be powered. But then when you want to factor in everything you think conceivably could influence it, you end up with a no result every single time by virtue of your sample size. And it's really just overcorrection, to be honest. So they don't present that. And what's really needed, honestly, is like kind of what we did with genomics with the All of Us, the MVP study, where you start to get millions of people. That's really what's required. You're going to need people where you've got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are really phenotyped really, really well, so you can build the true models that give you the answer. So to your point is, I don't know exactly it, and we haven't gone into it. Certainly. Certainly, I already told you that if HIV goes uncontrolled, it's doing exactly what alcohol's doing in there, all by itself. And there's enough data from ACTG and other groups that'll tell you that there's dysbiosis there. But as I just told you, dysbiosis really isn't enough. It's this very crude measure. What does that mean? Even within three simple enterotypes that we had, you saw that the genes producing butyrate and the distribution of the bacteria that make butyrate varied widely. And truthfully, that's probably going to end up being crude, like you only broke it up into three, you know, which is what they'll tell me five years from now, when we're better. So the cool thing about this, and for the newer investigators, no one really knows. And that was why my mentor told me to drop and do the HIV and heart disease. He goes, there's no NHLBI code for HIV. It doesn't exist. No one knows the answer to this question. No one's going to scoop you unless they have this cohort, which they don't. The NHLBI isn't collecting cohorts of people with HIV which he said, you know, this is why I think this is more of a career than this one-off on the grant. When I think about the microbiome and what's happening, it's not gonna be cures all that ails you, but I'm fairly certain there's so much that we don't understand that if you wanted to go into and connect it to your work and alcohol in the microbiome, it's gonna be there. Kendall already wants us to go to NIAAA and just give a brief talk on what little we have. And I'm not belittling us, but honestly, you know, this is like infant level stuff compared to what I know we could do. So the opportunity for, you know, graduate students, faculty, whatever, I think there's a lot, especially because it's a target. You know, we know alcohol's bad for you. We don't need another study for that. What we need is like, how do you make it better if we can't get them to quit drinking? This is a viable way to reduce risk. And that, I think, is a sexy kind of thing where people want to do that. Sorry if that word offended people. Okay. Um, and anything else? Or anything? Oh, yeah. Is 
that is a great question, and we haven't yet, but it's, um, oh, I can hear, we're all good. Um, uh, it would make biologic sense. We haven't looked at it yet. We kind of did like the audit yes, no with a cut point, and then we have timeline followed back with total grams of alcohol. But what's cool about embedding the microbiome study in the trial is that people are quitting. And they did quit, and we can prove that they quit. So the question is, did how long, one of the, how long does it take for the, the gut microbiome to change if it can? Does it take a week? Does it take a month? Does it take two months? If at three months we don't see anything, is that because the gut takes longer to heal itself, or is it, does it doesn't matter, and we're totally on the wrong track? I don't know. We're hoping that enough people quit and reduced over the course because they got pharmacotherapy that we'll know what everybody looks like at baseline. And this is why it kills me, and I'm really upset with Vladimir Putin, is because these people, when they were going in the trial, right, they'd be off all the agents that would have caused them to quit drinking. If they've stopped for a while, they may go back to the drinking again. I would have what they had at baseline, what they had when they quit, and then what they got if they went back to drinking with no interference. I'd have 10, I would know the exact answer to that question, which is why we put that in the grant. It's a 10-year study because we managed to fold this in, and he took that away. Idiot. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's disappointing because those things we could have done with, we would have 10 years and multiple time points on people, then we would get into it. And not only that, the methodology would be really cool. How do you do that? It hasn't really been done well. If I look through the literature, no one exactly knew how. So it's, that's another place for people to think about if you're starting a career. It's like, how do you capture this stuff over time? And we obviously need to know that, right? Because you know this is evolving. It's a living thing. It's changing. I have no idea what the answer to that question is. But it's obviously going to be important, right? If you're going to use it as a target, you got to know what it's doing. So, cool stuff. Lots to learn. All good. All right. Thanks, everybody.